Today on the Perception and Action Podcast, my interview with Harry Ramsey and Matt Dix to discuss their interesting new paper, Maximizing Grip on Deception and Disguise, Expert Sport Performance During Competitive Interactions. How can we understand deception in an ecological approach? How should we be studying these phenomena? So it's time for a call to action. Hi, this is Rob Gray from Arizona State University. I've been on a now over 25-year journey as a researcher, professor, and high-performance consultant to understand how we acquire and adapt our perceptual motor skills. Welcome to the Perception in Action podcast, where I discuss how psychological research can be applied to improving performance, accelerating skill acquisition, and designing technologies. Before we get to today's topic, I want to tell you about a couple extra things that might interest you if you're enjoying the podcast. First, my book, How We Learn to Move, A Revolution in the Way We Coach and Practice Sports Skills, is now available in audiobook format. You can find it on Audible or Amazon. Second, if you're interested in working directly with me, I currently have openings in my monthly mentorship program. This includes monthly Zoom meetings, either one-on-one or with your staff, analysis of your practice designs, and a monthly group discussion with coaches and instructors from a range of different sports. To find out more, please go to patreon.com forward slash perception action. Now on to the show. Okay, so today I'm uh, pleased to be joined by Harry and Matt to discuss their new paper um, in the journal Sports Medicine, looking at um, the issue of deception and disguise in sports. And as I was just saying to them before we started recording, um, this is a a topic that I get asked a lot about. You know, people interested in the ecological approach and anticipation They buy into a lot of things and and things, but one of the things that sometimes is hard to think about is how can we explain deception in in terms of an ecological approach? And I think you guys did a great job at proposing a a different way of thinking about it than we traditionally do. So, Harry, maybe we can uh, lead off with you and just um, tell us a little bit about the background, you know, what kind of situation you're trying to explain with this paper and kind of what's a traditional way that we think about um, deception in sports. Yeah. Thanks, Rob. Um, I think at least I spent a while trying to get my head around where I fit with the ecological approach and everything like that. Um, especially during the COVID situation with lockdown and I wasn't able to actually do my research. So I had a long time to to just read a lot and just try and figure out my position on things, which I kind of did, but then it changes all the time. Right. So, um, but one of the, I guess, difficult, things about it is the that idea of just specifying information and the idea that we always have the idea that we always have availability to that information at the point where we're making a decision or beginning to coordinate a response and i think that at least the situations that this paper is largely targeted to and where i think deception is most relevant are where the Spatial temporal constraints mean that a performer kind of, or like a defender kind of has to initiate a response before like the ball has been kicked or before their opponent has completed their action, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So there are certain situations, I think a penalty kick is a really obvious good example where the goalkeeper is kind of initiating that dive before the penalty takers actually make contact with the ball. So in my my ideas at that point in time maybe special specifying information like information that relates one to one to exactly where the ball can, is going to go isn't actually available to the goalkeeper mm-hmm. so that in in my eyes and that's where i drew on i think uh rob with a gin's continuum of contact um they're having to use non-specifying information to guide which way they're going to dive maybe mm-hmm. Or, um, and that's kind of my idea of thinking where it's these type of situations where deception can actually be used and be successful because maybe performers are more heavy, maybe like a defender is more heavily relying on the actions of the opponent to guide which way they're going to go mm-hmm. and how they're going to respond. So I guess that's the basis of the paper anyway. Yeah, no, I think that's a really good way to put it. You know, the idea, you know, the, the whole thing, thing that leads into the reason why we have to anticipate and why we can be deceived is you have to move before 
it's that information becomes available that and then that leaves open this opportunity. Matt, maybe we can get your background. I mean, for me, this kind of reminds me of, you know, almost the problem with uh, the issue of learning in, in ecological approach, right? It's the idea that Gibson proposed this idea of direct perception that the information is almost there and perfect, right? You should never be, there's information that specifies every event and you immediately pick it up. And how could you ever be wrong is kind of a issue that, um, or how could you get better at picking up information? Is it, To me, they kind of fit in the same. What's your kind of thinking about where you started with this, Matt? Yeah, um, so, I, I, yeah, very similar to Harry. I think the, there was definitely, for me, it, maybe it goes back as, as early as, you know, like sort of 10 years or, or more ago when I was doing my own um, PhD and was obviously interested in ecological psychology, but then um, trying to translate a lot of those ideas, particularly around, let's say, uh, specifying information and, and I suppose in particular, maybe uh, this perspective that was sort of developed maybe more so by Turvey and, and others with regards to sort of the the one-to-one um, sort of mapping of information and specifying information and so on. And I think I just, in some respects, just struggled to translate that into sports when the, it's there's competitive interactions between people. So it, although there is a, obviously a body of research in ecological psychology that often looks at more, let's say, cooperative situations between people. Um, so I'm thinking, uh, the let's say, the, the kind of Mike Richardson um, work on uh, interpersonal affordances and, and kind of how you perceive about carrying objects and when it exceeds what one person can do in terms of uh, carrying a, an object of a particular size and how the opportunities for action change when there's two people available to, to carry objects and so on. Um, but I think that a lot of those uh, social psychology sort of takes on ecological psychology often considered cooperative situations and not so much um, uh, competitive or non-cooperative situations. And so because sport is inherently um, yeah, competitive in terms of when you're competing against people, of course they're they're going to do things where you're you're trying to mislead or or deceive your opponent, and then it may well be that uh, specifying information in a, in a let's say a, a strictly kind of one to one sense might not always necessarily be available to the perceiver, um, and then yeah, I guess that then poses challenges for a. a direct perception and, and ecological psychology perspectives. And it was for, yeah, for me, sort of Rob, um, Rob's work, Rob Withkin's work that, that helped to sort of frame why non-specifying information um, doesn't necessarily imply indirect perception mm -hmm. um, and, and sort of taking some of those ideas to, to translate that into to sport as best as possible. And, and as Harry alluded to, I think this idea of continuum of contact is quite helpful in, in that respect. Yeah, no, it definitely. Harry, maybe you can, can you uh, get into a little more of that, uh, that topic and how kind of getting into some of Rob's uh, with again's work, uh, talking about how, how you, how you used it. Can you tell us, get a little more specific on the continuum of contact? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, again, I, I got this from maybe where I first came across, it was actually one of Matt's papers with Rob. Um, I think that can you hearten expertise with like video mm -hmm. papers? Um, the idea is that the information available to you is kind of on this continuum of completely specific to not very specific at all. So some information being more reliable than other forms of information. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where you get maybe some papers. Um, again, sorry, a penalty kick example. Um, Lopez is one of them. And then Diaz was another paper. I can't remember mm -hmm. the first name of the authors, but they've had a look at saying how reliable is some of the kinematic information um, and what's the relationship between the kinematic information and the way the ball went? So is there even information from the way that someone moves that relates quite highly to the result and outcome? And that's kind of an I gives you an indication of what non-specified information that could be potentially useful. So like I think, uh, again, penalty kick, 
the that angle of the non kicking foot um, as it's placed next to the ball is somewhat reliable in indicating which way the ball's going to go. Mm-hmm. Um, but obviously, it's not specific. Um, it's not hundred. It's not one to one. Having a one to one relationship, but if a goalkeeper has to initiate a dive before the ball is being kicked, then maybe that's the best information available to them. But it also helped me bring in, maybe I should have brought this up later, but maybe I'll say it now anyway, also helped me to bring in that idea that I know you, you've done some work, at least in the past, Rob, and I watched your talk online at ESAN a couple of years ago, which was related to this, the idea that we also have contextual information or what I kind of liked, or me and Matt like to go anyway, like information that occurred over longer time scales. And that's where you get things like sequences or like the tendencies of an opponent that maybe influence how you respond to them. And I, in the past, I never really knew how to frame this information. I think lots. Um, it's kind of, I guess, avoided a lot in the ecological approach in the sense that it doesn't really fit. Um, and that there's a tendency to look at, right, the information is available in the unfolding interaction in that moment. Um, but then often we have evidence from some research that these sequ- like prior sequences, sequences maybe influence mm-hmm. people's behavior. So that's where I got some inspiration from your 2002 paper with the um, <laughs> baseball batter uh, about the, how the pitch type, the sequence of the pitch type maybe influenced their, their coordination. Yeah, no, that's take that's taking me back. <laughs> yes, like, um, one of the ways that I I don't know how this fits with you, your guys thinking. And, and I always I think of it also in terms of specifying for what, right? Um, like when a in my sport, like when a baseball pitcher is winding up, everyone says, "Well, there's not specifying information about time to contact and direction of the ball." Then, well, do you need it? Then <laughs> you don't. Your, your goal at that point in the action is not to try to get to the bat to a specific place. It's try to move your body kind of coarsely. So I think if we think about what the goal, that the, there's ch- changing goals during the – it's not just one goal dive to the spot in the corner where the shot is. It's making a gross body movement to get ready to pick up and things like that. So that's kind of how I think about it too. But I think it's kind of along the same lines. Matt, did you want to – yeah, I think like the other thing that maybe I, sh- I should have um, maybe mentioned, or at least just the the points that you've both mentioned, uh, just made me think of is that I think also the the question of at least something like anticipation um, has often tended to focus on um, sort of where to move and not necessarily when to move. Mm-hmm. So I think in I mean, and then this in itself then presents a slightly different challenge because I think you in an ecological sense i do i would think that there certainly is specifying information available in terms of perhaps time to contact between um the run up or the approach of uh, you know a penalty taker and to the ball so there's something in the the penalty takers uh, movements as they run towards the ball that specifies the time to contact with when they will will, will kick it mm-hmm. And there, there may well be information, depending on their use of deception or disguise, but there may well be information available that sort of specifies the the velocity of the kick um, uh, from their, their actions. And I think that there's certainly analyses that have been done um, in, I think, football, tennis, possibly baseball, you'll, you'll know better than me, that they give this information about like when to move, but not necessarily where to move in a, a lateral uh, sense. And and I think this is often the challenge in some of the anticipation tasks that, that people might study with regards to the, the classical examples, perhaps of um, uh, penalty kick tennis, um, maybe cricket as well, if, it, if you're asking people to make judgments or or um, decisions about whether a ball will go to the left or to the right of them. I think that people likely when they're playing those sports aren't necessarily just getting that information, but they're primarily getting information about when to move and not always where to move in advance. Um, Because a lot of that may be information about where to move unfolds once the ball or the 
the object is in flight, but they're they're getting the information about when to move from uh, the opponent's actions, and 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 maybe some of that those nuances in terms of information that's available and how anticipation is controlled is not as well understood part partly because of perhaps some of the methods that we've used to study anticipation previously. Um, so that so I think that that is. Um, also at play here and not always recognized in in, a, in some of the anticipation research. Yeah, I was going to, that's a great point, Matt. I think you guys did a good job. Harry, maybe you want to talk a little bit about kind of what you see are some of the limitations of the methods people have used to study deception. Yeah. I think, I think the first like obvious point to address and of understandable reasons is that um, a lot of the research is done using the video based classic video based designs where there's a video on a screen, it's included at maybe various time pot to points and then um, a player resuming the position of an opponent is asked just to either comment um, or write down or move a joystick perhaps to get a better measure of reaction time, which way they think they would go kind of thing. Um, and it, I mean, there's, there's absolute value to that in terms of the ability to control the situations really well. And then you can show every participant the same stimuli, the same videos. Whereas, as I'm finding out at the moment, when you're trying to do some of the in situ stuff and you're asking someone to be deceptive and you have different people being deceptive for other different people, it's quite messy and confusing because <laughs> people are trying to deceive in different ways, no matter how much you try and control your instruction to them and everything beforehand. Um, but for me, that's I'm really big on trying to be as representative as possible in the study, in the situations I'm sampling, if I want to generalize to that situation. And that comes from a little bit of um, Matt's research, especially that penalty kick study, where when you have different response behaviors, um, going all the way from actually facing a penalty kick, being required to dive and intercept it, um, to down to, you know, next level down is moving, but not actually required to intercept, all the way down to just watching a video and just making a judgment. Mm -hmm. you often find that kind of the eye movements people exhibit are different and the, um, the timing of response is different. So if you want to be, if you want to generalize your findings from your research to the sports situation you're actually interested in, I'm big on making that situation that I'm studying as representative as possible mm -hmm. um, to make sure that whatever behaviors I'm seeing relate a bit more closely to what behaviors they're actually going to be doing as they're playing the sport. Um, so that's big for me. It creates a bit of messiness in the, in the data collection and everything like that. But then I think if I'm, if I'm manipulating a variable like deception or the sequence or a combination of the two, if I actually do find then an effect, I can be quite sure that that is something of interest, even through all of the mess, this effect is coming through. And it's likely that the, the messiness isn't adding to the effect of anything it's going to moderate it and take away from it. Um, so I, I feel fairly confident then that if I've manipulated something and it comes through all of the mess, that it's something that we should be focusing on. It's something that's important. Um, yeah, no, I agree with you. <laughs> I agree hundred percent. I think, you know, we, we've basically taken the, the methods are, you're asking someone to make a binary choice prediction. So it's not surprising the behavior looks predictive, <laughs> right? You're, 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 and it fits with something like a Bayes model. Um, even like the deception, I think, Matt, going back to your point, I think the other issue is I think you want to, it, it's a, in a continuous interaction, <laughs> right? And a video doesn't have that, right? The, the deceiver doesn't change based on what the defender's doing in the, you know, right? So I think that's a really critical point you guys raised in that paper too. Yeah. But yeah, I know, I think I've had a, you know, I've almost uh, got uh, strong enough to call, uh, sometimes I, I've said that the anticipation results are kind of artifacts in a way, in a, like, you obviously expert performers are different, sensitive to different information. And if you force them to make this kind of prediction, they're better at it, but it doesn't necessarily mean that's what they do, I think, when they're actually performing their sport. Yeah. Um, so to kind of reframe it, maybe I'll go to Matt. You you guys use the kind of skill intentionality framework, uh, the grip on affordance. Can you tell us a little bit about how you how you kind of th thought that would be a good fit for explaining deception? 
Um, or yeah, if, or not, I, well, I might say that Harry's much better than that on me. On me okay, do you, want, do you want to go? I'll, I'll give it a go. Yeah. Please. I think that, so the, um, uh, maybe it was quite sort of motivated by um, the the distinction that's uh, perhaps made in the first instance, or, or this the distinction of landscape and, and field of affordances is, is, is partly um, something that, I wouldn't say that um, I feel as though I have a really good, uh, complete sort of understanding. Obviously, um, Eric Rietveld and and uh, some of his collaborators are in in philosophy more so than uh, perhaps sort of certainly this sport skill acquisition literature. And I think there's quite a bit of background there in terms of uh, wider perspectives in philosophy um, that have informed their perspectives, but. I think it's maybe trying to understand um, uh, the the distinction of there being a, a landscape of affordances that might be available to um, a uh, let's say a, a sort of well an entire population um, of people, and then a, a field of affordances in terms of of those possible of affordances. Which one of those sort of show up to you most prominently in a in a situation or in, in a moment? And I think that what um, we've perhaps tried to sort of sketch or discuss within the paper is the idea that as part of that interaction and as part of that um, maybe uh, manipulation of context or or pattern that maybe one person is trying to do to influence the other, they're also maybe sort of illuminating a particular kind of field or, or opportunity for an opponent, but they're they're doing that in such a way that they're misleading the opponent. So um, examples that, you know, going back to your work, um, for instance, Rob, or, or placing it in the context of a penalty kick, you might take a penalty to one side of the goal two or three uh, occasions in a row, and that might then show up that uh, the next penalty that somebody's going to take you start to anticipate ahead of time that they're going to follow that same pattern or that same sequence. Um, and that influences then how you, you anticipate um, because of this pattern that your opponent has created against you rather than just um, anticipating more in the, in the here and now on the basis of their, of their uh, movement kinematics. Um, I don't know, if, Harry, if that captured some of it or if there's... Um, points that you want to add uh, specifically yeah i mean yeah it was good it was yeah pretty much the same but um, i may as well so i think it, it was me initially that went to matt with the idea of this that maximum grip account i think i just for for a while i think going back to that point you made rob about the fact that it's an interaction you've got one person trying to influence the other and the other person trying to influence the other i don't think i never i never found a way from reading of really capturing or describing how someone has like a dominance over that interaction. And that was my idea of bringing in that maximum grip account being that someone tends to have a better grip on the interaction than another potentially, or, or often it can be quite balanced and that's where you'll see like a moment of stability and maybe both players share a kind of grip on at the moment, but it's, it's in that kind of metastable state where it can go either way, um, which I don't want to get into too much, but I wanted to kind of, I came across this, I think it was in um, author's names, I should should have remembered, and I didn't. Um, Michael Kimmel and Christian Rogler, um, they did that really nice paper in a uh, keto, um, and that's where they, they mention uh, or refer to some of Rebell's work and that maximum grip account, and I really liked it in terms of framing how someone tries to kind of gain an advantage on the on that situation and it, it ties really closely into what matt said about the field and the landscape which again was something that matt introduced me introduced me to their work um and then a really nice that idea of having a grip on a situation and it, it was a really nice quote from um Rietveld and kiverstein's 2014 paper i think that is the a rich landscape of affordances paper and they, they just say that typically it will only be those affordances that will appear to improve an individual's grip 
on a particular situation that will invite or solicit an individual's action. And I really liked that quote for helping me kind of tie that idea of grip and deception together. So the important bit is that like one influences invite behavior. I really like that as a concept that you're kind of, whether explicitly or implicitly in a given situation, you're just drawn towards acting in a particular way. So you can think of an attacker moving in a certain way that almost invites some kind of tackle from an opponent. If we're talking like an open play situation in football or soccer, for example. Um, but the key part there being that um, certain information or affordances can appear to improve an individual's grip. And that's where we have that idea of deception, that you're almost suggesting something to an opponent so that opponent feels like, oh, I know what's about to happen. I'm able to act accordingly and intercept you only to then, at, as late as possible, adjust your action and misdirect the opponent. So that was um, that's where that all ties in really nicely to me and allowed me to kind of bring deception into more of an ecological count, which I hadn't necessarily been done before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I, I think it's a great fit too, Harry. And I, that was a really good explanation. I, I always think of, when I think of the maximum grip, I always think of like a two-on-one play in sports. Like you're, you're trying to hold the affordances of passing, shooting, driving. You're made, trying to hold all those open. <laughs> like, like instead of just, there's my goal, I'm going to shoot on the goal. Um, you're, you're maintaining your spacing. You're also, but you're right. You're also, you can think about that situation. You're maintaining yourself so that you don't give away what you're going to do. Right. Um, and which I think is a really, it's kind of an interesting thing. We don't really think about, you know, we talk about get to the classic coupling, you know, we perceive to act, we act to perceive, but we we don't talk about we act to manipulate the information we give <laughs> to other people. I think that's a really kind of different thing we haven't really thought about, a lot about. But it's true, right? Um, for sure. Um, so that relates yeah. into the, I guess, mm. disguise a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. So in order to, to disguise being that you're not necessarily trying to portray that you're going to do one thing and then do something else. So there's not an intention to misdirect but there may be that intention where, okay, I've got multiple things I could possibly do. This kind of when you might get that. So right. But when, when there's like a, the system itself, I don't want to get into this, but like too much, but the system itself is in that metastable state where there's many things it can go in any, any, many directions. And that's when you have like the unpredictability about you. It's quite hard for the opponent then to know how to, how to position themselves relative to you in order to kind of limit most of those options or not. And that, that's where it ties ties into that kind of final section of the paper in terms of how um, I guess we've always modeled the defender as someone who is just responding to what the attacker is doing. They're mm -hmm. just, they're just passively. Yes. They're um, actively picking up information with the iron head movements, but in terms of how they interact, they're just passively waiting for them to do something. And then whenever they need to, they respond. But in reality, what you have is a defender who's also interacting and attempt to um, influence what the attacker is going to do. So maybe just take this to the side a little bit. Um, you think about like agility, something that's talked about obviously quite a lot uh, these days, quite a hot topic in the sports space. Um, often that will maybe be assessed by someone responding to, even if it's on a big screen, let's take a rugby example. Someone's, running with the ball on towards you on the screen, you're taking the role of a defender and then you're having to move towards the side. You think they go to represent some kind of interception of them. And that may be how we try and get a representative assessment of someone's agility rather than just doing a change of direction, drill around coats. But in this situation, you could still have someone who's actually not so good at their agility task, responding to something on the screen. But then if you take what they do over the course of the season in a game, you actually say, actually, they're really good. They're maybe our best player in these 1v1 situations and they make loads of successful interceptions. So what, what are we missing? And maybe the thing we're missing is actually that performer's ability to influence what that attacker is doing. Maybe they're able to position themselves in such a way that, you know, maybe they trick them a little bit to see the person on the ball. So they kind of say, okay, here's, they almost invite them to say, go on, take me on, go down the line, there's loads of space for you. 
with that awareness that they can adapt and still make an interception. So obviously those screen-based things, when you're taking that ability to influence and interact, you might be taking away someone's biggest skill. Um, yeah. If that makes sense at all. Totally. I, I totally agree with you. I think we way kind of undersell the intentions of the defender, right? They they could be driving someone to the other defender, oh, drive, put them on their weak foot, try to steal the ball. <laughs> like we assume it's just one thing all the time when it's it's it surely is not, and it depends on skill level and a bunch of other things. So so I think um, yeah, I totally agree with you there. So how do, do I guess one question my people might ask though is how how do you develop this ability to be deceptive? Maybe, you know, is if, if it's not just doing kind of these pre-programmed moves, um, you know, um, I, it, it's funny. I see it like, especially soccer, a lot of the deception seems to be practiced by yourself. <laughs> People doing these, these step over moves and all these distant fancy things. Um, Harry, is there in your kind of in your paper, do you think about different ways to think about how to train deception and how to prevent being deceived? Yeah, that's a very good question. And maybe Matt will have some better ideas on this than me. As maybe in the process of writing that, there wasn't something I thought about so much. Um, I guess, I guess broadly, um, I think this relates, so I'm going to say it. Uh, um, one of the things that I feel like maybe we don't do an amazing job of is giving players in training the opportunity to like explore and fail a lot like it's i appreciate from a coach's perspective why you might not want to do a session where everyone's getting things wrong all the time and messing up because you don't want that to then be carried into performance if you've only got a game in a few days time but um i think it's important to i guess one if you, you need to explore both ways so like maybe if you're a defender play around with trying to respond as late as possible to the point where you leave too late, you initiate a response way too late, so you're not giving yourself a time, enough time to respond. But also maybe play around the other way. So you're trying to initiate a response as early as possible. You're using a lot earlier information to guide what you're what you're doing in that sense. Um, and that's where you maybe that's the way you kind of find that sweet spot, that middle ground of what's suitable for you as an individual, right? You've got to fail both ways maybe to work out that middle ground. That's kind of my view on that from a defender's perspective. Mm -hmm. And the same thing from an attacker's perspective in that there needs to be, in terms of learning to deceive, I mean, one, you just made that great point that, yes, you can't really practice that in isolation because the whole part of what I try to explain is maybe that figure that I put in the paper is that, yes, you can try and mislead an opponent, but if they aren't then being misled by you, the deception isn't going to work. And you need to be, as an attacker, as someone forming deception you need to be responsive to that you can't just continue um continue your action as if they've been if the opponent's been deceived because if they haven't it's not going to be successful so you need to be aware of whether that opponent is actually falling for or being misdirected by you or being misled by you so that's where it's integral to perform these things against an opponent um and then providing that opportunity for exp exploration again from the attacker's perspective if they aren't given the opportunity and training to explore try new things to mess up essentially, mess up more times than they are successful. They aren't kind of going to, they're not really given the opportunity to learn new things that might work for them, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm, for I'm sure. sure Matt has a lot to add to that that I yeah. did not discuss. Yeah, Matt, do you want to? Yeah, yeah, I mean, so like something that um, just brings to mind uh, based on what Harry was saying. So like when I used to do quite a lot of football coaching, one of the things that I used to enjoy was um, – if you use like just a, a small sided game format and then um, uh, giving players on, on each team a number and then a, a sort of a, an instruction um, of if you're a number one, you can only use your left foot. This is in, in football, soccer. If you're a number two, when you get the ball, you have to do something that makes everybody laugh. If you're a number three, mm -hmm. uh, you have to try a trick that you've never tried before. If you're number four, you're not allowed to run. You can only walk. Um, so, like, just doing things like that that would be primarily done, um, not necessarily with, like, a specific goal in mind of, like, this is to develop your skill or develop your creativity. But um, I think one of the things that you would I would notice is that there would be some um, – uh, 
uh, some players, some children that maybe hadn't really ever practiced some of those skills in the context of a game. And then they started to real or they started to see how they could use them in the context of the game. So I think sometimes like the these notions of sometimes they get posed a little bit binary, like it's isolated practice or it's in the game and and we you know that we can't see a way of uh, integrating them. I I think it's just more a question of just acknowledging that if you want to get good in the context of a game, you have to effectively play that game. So if you're developing some skills or attributes or even like physical capacities, you know, doing some gym work where you're improving your your strength, you then need to learn how to use those capacities in the context of the game and there maybe shouldn't be an assumption from a coach or a learner that doing something outside of the game will just immediately transfer into the game. So having some acknowledgement of yeah, encouraging somebody who you know, might not, um, or when they're away from a, a group practice and they want to practice a skill individually, of course, this is something that a lot of children do, but just then acknowledging that there needs to be a, a, a a platform, a place for them to practice some of those skills, those tricks in the context of the game. Um, I think that, that that's something that is um, potentially fruitful in the, in terms of developing deception, albeit that I can't necessarily point to specific studies that, uh, that can show that as a way of harnessing uh, deception. Um, but I, I do sort of acknowledge that I think at least just anecdotally from some of my experiences of when I, I used to do quite a lot of coaching, you would see sometimes maybe uh, players, children that they were really skillful, but then not in the game. And I think often it was maybe because they practiced these skills outside of the game, but then didn't really practice bringing them into the game and or at least weren't encouraged to bring them into the game as much. So, so maybe as a coach, just giving that goal or that um, intention from a coaching session for for somebody to really try out different things in the context of a game, I think is is quite important. You know, like the role of the game is that if you don't try a trick when you get the ball, you lose a point for your team. Mm-hmm. Like just putting those sort of things in place, I think can can be beneficial. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I, I think yeah, the fun, fundamental idea, you need something, someone to deceive, right? I think, you know, I think the ecological approach, you would learn through experience, you learn when I do this, it causes my opponent to go to the left when I'm going the right, right? It's not a cognitive, you know, um, I haven't looked, Matt, Harry, maybe because you've been looking into it. I haven't really looked at a lot of the research lately, but is there, do we understand, I, I, I would, my guess is no, that we don't understand what makes for a, a deceptive, like uh, in terms of specifically how to deceive someone other than like situational context. I, I served, you know, th- four down the line on when I'm behind the score most of the time then I do it opposite. In terms of movement, I know in baseball, right, there's some pitchers that are way better than they should be because of how hard they throw, they're way more successful. Everyone says, oh, they're deceptive, but no one can explain why. (laughs) What what are they doing? There's no simple, I I think probably because it's some higher order information, but do do we understand like in in, in soccer penalty kick, what do you do specifically with your body to make a deception? Do we understand that? I know it's a big big question there, but (laughs) just came to my head. Yeah. I mean, I actually gave, presentation on Monday about penalty kicks and I briefly spoke about this but mm-hmm. I think it's at least from that research kinematically like some variables are more manipulative than others mm-hmm. um, but then those you're probably in a situation where in a, in a penalty kick the goalkeeper also knows that those things can be manipulated more so than others so you're talking like where the player's looking um, mm-hmm. where the head angle is angled towards or the angle of the run up maybe certain angles well certain angles are set or better related to certain kick directions. If you ask people to be non-deceptive and recorded that over a number of trials, you'd probably find some kind of relative pattern on where they're initiating their run-up. But then at the same time, we have this situation where I try to address in the paper where, because often we find, and I don't, we don't actually have the answer to this either, as far as I'm aware, but because often what's found in research papers is that 
those non-deceptive actions are potentially quite easy to anticipate or intercept above chance levels, even for non-skilled performers. Mm-hmm. For a performer to even get to the highest level, the actions are probably relatively challenging to read in general. So their like stock way of passing or way of shooting is probably not very revealing in and of itself. Um, so perhaps what we more have is more situations of disguise or even every action is somewhat disguised. Um, and it's only towards the end of the action anyway that performers start to tweak. So if you so there is actually a really nice example. I need to get the videos, but I, I haven't. Um, so um, I gave a talk on Rich Clark's online agility um, course that he's been running. And I remember he watching one of his presentations on there. I think he got some videos from uh, James Wilde, who does some work with Harlequins as like a sports scientist or strength and conditioning coach. And he had this really nice video of an overlay of um, one of the Harlequins players with the rugby ball um, coming forward with the ball and then doing a sidestep, one left and one right. And they were overlaid over each other. And you could just see how, in slow motion, just how well it matched up until very, very late in the movement um, where it started to differ and that's when he went one way went the other. So as a defender, from that, that's a really nice, probably the best example of disguise I've seen in like a video format where you really don't know which way they're going, they're going to go until very, very late. Um, so I know that didn't necessarily answer the question very well. No, no, I think, I think, uh, yeah, no, I think you're, you're, um, you're right. I think your point's well taken about the, the, the stimuli we use are very, and I get that a lot in, you know, there's some sports where they train people using anticipation tasks and I, the feedback I hear a lot as well. That's just the same picture over and over. You know, it's not like no variation. And I have to go face the ones that do all these different things. Um, it's easy in the, when you're giving me that. So, yeah, I think that that's for sure a fair point. Um, but, yeah, I think I think that's a really interesting um, question. So I guess, you know, that leads in kind of the final point. Maybe I'll, I'll start with you, Harry, and Matt, you can add kind of – you get some good suggestions about where, how we – you know, I think – there's a lot to understand <laughs> with this is you're kind of, um, if we're going to take this sports, but you get some good suggestions about how to move this topic forward. Can you maybe talk a little bit about, about that? Uh, sure. I'll, I'll try and talk about that. Yeah. Um, Matt can fill in the gaps of the things I miss. There's something I haven't really spoke about too much yet, which I know um, you brought up a couple of times, Rob, but I maybe didn't say some of the things I wanted to about it. So one of the sections is about those sequence manipulations and, tying that in with the role of deception. So Mm -hmm. I remember, obviously, typically, I guess, for the benefit of statistical analysis, research studies will be like, okay, half the trial is going to be deceptive, half the trial is going to be non-deceptive. We'll just throw those in in a random order for every participant and see if the deceptive ones are harder to intercept than the non-deceptive ones. But we, one paper from, I can't remember his first name, but Hunter, I think out in Australia, it's a penalty kick paper, and they did a really interesting approach where they kind of allowed the penalty taker and the goalkeeper just to do what they want, right? Interact. So the penalty taker is free to deceive whenever they want, to deceive how they want, and the goalkeeper is free to do the same in reverse. Um, just to try and see what kind of what, what do we see? What do we see when that's allowed? And I don't think these players were like elite, elite, but they're still obviously quite skilled players. And one of the interesting findings that struck out to me was, at least from the way they just coded the penalty taker's behavior. Um, they were only deceptive on like 14% of the, the penalty kicks. So they weren't using deception 50% of the time, right? <laughs> so my, my thinking was maybe there is a lot of people, a lot of the research looks at or thinks it's deception about being the way it is performed, but maybe there is something also about setting up situations where it's more likely to be successful. So you don't just do it all the time or half the time you maybe try and manipulate your sequence of actions so that when you do deception, it's much more likely to actually be successful. So you create up then a, a better situation of trying to score or something like that. Um, that was kind of my thinking. And that's where kind of the, I guess the direction of my PhD is taken where I've tried to create some studies to look at if we manipulate the sequence, can we maximize the chance deception is going to be successful? So 
in comparison to like deception that's just randomly thrown in, mm-hmm. if we, so say in a penalty kick study, if the penalty kick taker goes to the bottom left corner with non-deception three times in a row, if on the fourth penalty, they make it look like they're going to do the same again, but then actually end up unfolding, like as their action unfolds, shape to kick it right at the end, is that more likely, so is that deception following three non-deception? Mm-hmm. more likely to deceive than just deception that's randomly thrown in. So have we set up a situation that is more likely to be successful? And that is in part grounded in the idea that players are somewhat using sequence information to guide which way they expect the ball to go, whether they are like explicitly aware of that or not. Because mm-hmm. um, that's one of the interesting things to me, I think, is, and I'm not, I don't know how well it's been looked at. So there's a few like video-based papers that will do a sequence, um, four passes in the same row, the same way, or four shot types in the same row. And then the participant will expect the fifth one to be the same again, for example. Mm-hmm. But I wanted to know if that still happens if we study in situ. So is that, is that something that still happens when they're actually having to interact and make a response? Um, in the penalty kick study, maybe that's not happening at all. But I'm also doing kind of the same one with a basketball um, pass scenario to someone just passing to the left or right defender in the middle trying to intercept and I was doing some data collection for that this week and at least it seemed with the girls there's there's some instances where clearly they are it'll go the same way four times in a row and then the fifth time they kind of they and they will successfully intercept all of those and then the fifth one all goes the other way even with non-deception and they've kind of stuck to the spot and then afterwards, I do a few quick questions just to ask them how they found it and what their approach was for anticipate, uh, trying to intercept the passes and whether, they're, whether they noticed anything about the patterns. And they often will not notice the pattern. They will not notice that four went one way and then one went the other way. But it looked like they were thrown off by that. So that's kind of an interesting thing for me that I've tried to explore. Because I know that if players are somewhat using those patterns and it is influencing what they do, it might be at odds a little bit with the traditional ecological approach, which is interesting and fine. Maybe not, but I think the one way I have of explaining it, which I haven't, isn't necessarily tied into the way I've studied it, but is the um, the concept the concept of hysteresis, kind of from dynamical systems, mm-hmm. the idea that your preceding actions influence what you're currently going to do. So I think uh, a nice way of well, that's been studied in the past is just where you pick up a box and move it and then those boxes are ascend in size and you're interested at what point they shift to use two hands to pick up and move the box and then you'll do it descending as well and you'll see that the point that they shift from one hand to two hand differs depending on whether it was ascending or descending in size mm-hmm. so it's not necessarily guided by specific information so to do with the box size relative to your hand size but also in part by which way you came so the preceding sequence seems to have some influence over our behavior, whether we are explicitly aware of that or not. Um, and that's kind of one of the things I'm super interested in. I'm trying to research based on my suggestions. I know I didn't maybe answer. Exactly no, no, the, I think that's <laughs> great. <laughs> that's great here. That's, I think about it the same way too, you know, you know, I, example I would give like, if you break your car, you are driving your car around and it's icy and you break it. And each time you break it, you're, you're slowing down at a slower rate <laughs> because it's icy than you normally do, you're going to recalibrate your behavior, your action, right? Mm-hmm. Based on the sequence of events, right? If you, you can assign that the person's also expecting something like a cognitive level that that's slowly and I'm going to, but it really doesn't add much to me, <laughs> right? And it's also defining it in terms of the control law and the calibration level actually makes more specific predictions. And also I think exciting, I think we were getting at a little bit. It's possible you could get much more subtle effects of context and things than these big ones that we study, you know, I'm gonna do things the same thing five times in a row, then switch. If if it's happening at this lower level of a, you could do much more subtle things that might be affecting people um, because they're, you know, the tuning, the tractors or whatever what level you want to explain it. You don't necessarily mean, need a conscious cognitive recollection. This person always does this thing. Now I, they're going to do that. Right. So I think that that's a really good yeah, point there. Exactly. That's one of the really important things to me. Yeah. Like people are 
somewhat manipulated by series of events like information mm-hmm. on longer time scales are they aware of it or not and that's if they're not which it seems to be the case that's quite interesting mm-hmm. that's a, an interesting yeah and i think that's an important point it's not you're not and like the same with me you're not arguing these things don't have an effect <laughs> clearly they do the sequence of events the context the play but it's just different explanation for what's going on mm-hmm. with it. yeah yes yeah exactly. yeah um, Matt, do you want to add anything about maybe uh, uh, the kind of way to move this field forward, different kind of ways to to um, study the topic of deception? Yeah. Um, so I think like Harry, uh, yeah, get, gave a good answer of some of the, certainly some of the ideas uh, within the paper. I think that, I mean, irrespective of someone's, uh, say, kind of underpinning theoretical rationale, I I do think that there's definitely been a, a real nice uh, progression in terms of our understanding of, of deception um, in the literature. And, and as Harry alluded to, like the some of the works that have been really motivated in in, in his PhD and and that we've discussed and and really liked some of those works. They they weren't they weren't take their starting point wasn't from a, an ecological psychology perspective, but the the findings that they have are then really, really interesting to then set up a study to to test something that might be motivated by an ecological uh, perspective. So I think there's some, you know, some really nice work that that is being done and and the field is is progressing. I think that probably one of the, uh, not to say that this isn't um, somebody that is uh, more interested in perhaps um, some of the, let's say, Bayesian prize perspectives or even uh, active inference um, kind of perspectives. It, it's not to say that they're not interested in this, but I think that maybe one of the, the motivation factors for perhaps work that I might try to do or, or Harry's doing in his PhD is it then becomes a real question of, okay, so what does this mean for the control of movement or for the uh, the kind of behavior of participants that uh, I to really understand some of these questions um uh, you want to try as much as possible to study this aspect of skill as an interaction between people and to do that you maybe do need to to move towards um some sort of real-time situation rather than a use of a video but but that's uh, in the same breath you know there have been some really really beneficial new novel findings that have stemmed from video studies that have set up uh, the work that that Harry's doing. So, um, yeah, if I was to kind of be biased, I would say, yeah, let's try and find new ways of of, um, looking at interactions and the factors that influence expertise and skill in those interactions between people. Um, But certainly there's, that's not the only way. And there are, um, I think, uh, certainly developments theoretically in some of the more cognitive um, oriented work that that is generating some some really nice findings as well so uh, yeah I think as I say interaction is a way forward but but also that the, there's some other uh, recent perspectives that that have generated some nice work in in deception yeah no I agree Matt and you know like the like you could look at the like some of the occlusion work you know showing us that the lower body is where the information is like that's very useful there's very useful things that have become out of that even though the method may be not as representative as we want i think you're right there's lots of different ways to study the same thing and uh, yeah i agree and i i, I think you know i i the, what i've been trying to push is the same information that we think is is being used for a lot more than just some I, the kind of movement away from being deceived as this discrete event in time <laughs> versus, you know, you're using this information and yeah, uh, continuously, I, th- I think. is yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I think that that's the, one of the insightful things that, mm-hmm. that Harry's um, mm-hmm. come up with is this side. I, you know, I've done studies of deception where I've got a protocol of a hundred trials, 50 of which are deceptive, 50 of which are non-deceptive. You then show that deception is harder to anticipate than non-deception. But if then somebody, a sports person, always used deception, well, then does that no longer become deceptive? Because actually you always, they're always trying to deceive in a, a given situation. And maybe to be deceptive, the way that you can do that effectively is through setting up situations through non-deception 
and then using deception at the right time. So on a longer time scale, non-deception becomes part of deception or disguise becomes part of deception. Um, and I think those are some of the really insightful things that, that Harry has uh, come up with in that paper and, and in his PhD work. Yeah, no, I, I it definitely and it fits well with, you know, a lot of things I experience in sports I work in, you know, pitchers setting up, you know, they're they're planning for later in the game. <laughs> they're not plan, but they're kind of uh, got a holding affordances, right? They're not just immediately thinking about getting this uh, this thing done. They're you know thinking about deceiving someone, you know, be able to trick someone later in the game. So yeah, I think it's really nice. And so um, this is out. It's in sports medicine, right, Harry? The, your paper. It's in sports medicine open. Okay. Um, Perfect. Yeah. So I think it's a nice, uh, not too long. Uh, good. I think it's a good way to, to, to bring it forward. And uh, um, I, I'm looking forward to some of the work you do from, from it. Yeah, I think it is challenging once you're, you're going to do an interaction. Like you, you said a couple of times, this is a me- bit messier <laughs> than having a, you know, discreet uh, deception and events. So, but I look forward to seeing the, the work that comes out of it. So thanks for joining me guys. Okay, that's it for today's episode. Remember, you can contact me at robgray at asu.edu or follow me on Twitter at ShakeyBaits. To find out more about the podcast, please check out perceptionaction.com. Finally, to support the podcast and receive bonus materials, including written transcripts, please head over to patreon.com forward slash perceptionaction. This is Rob Gray from ASU. Cheers for now and keep them coupled. Oh,